said Benjamin Franklin. Yes, this is exactly what Dentist Channel Online is facilitating the dental professionals to acquire the knowledge from the experience, experiences of the learned and eminent dental professionals from across time zones. So dear friends, hearty welcome to you all for joining us for this session on submerged implants, increasing treatment options by Dr. Vinu Matthew. I'm Dr. Ashwin here from Bengaluru signing in as moderator for this session by Dr. Vinu Matthew. So we are, we have now arrived at the session six of the eighth day of Virtual Implant Expo 2020. So in this juncture, I take this opportunity and it's my privilege to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Vinu Matthew for the session. Hearty welcome to you, sir. To introduce, Dr. Vinu Matthew did his master's in prosthodontics from Manipal Academy in 1998. He continued to do his master's in implant dentistry from Warwick University in mm -hmm. UK in the year 2010. He worked in Zayed Military Hospital for six years and he has been in private practice uh, for the past 10 years. And currently he is director of Aspen Dental Polyclinic at Abu Dhabi. He has presented various seminars and talks in various national and international events. So with this introduction, dear participants, now I'm presenting to you Dr. Vinu Matthew for this session of Virtual Implant Expo 2020 that is being organized by Dentist Channel Online. Sir, hearty welcome once again, and I request you to take out the session, sir. Thank you. Hi, good morning to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Dentist Channel for giving me this opportunity to uh, come in this uh, mega bonanza we call as the Virtual Implant Expo, which is going to I think which has done uh, comprehensively uh, did talk about, talks about all the aspects of implant industry and it has been a knowledgeable tool. So I think we are coming towards the end of it. So today I will, I'm given the opportunity to uh, discuss on a topic which is quite close to my heart. Um, actually the topic is a little bit confusing because it was not submerged, it was subcrustal implants anyway. It's almost similar, but it has a little dif difference when it comes to the application of it. So let me start my talk today. So today's uh, topic, I will start the screen, right? Okay. okay. All right. So today's my topic of discussion is about subcrustal implants and increasing the implant treatment option. So as I told you, I have some experience in uh, implants and I have been, I have done my masters and the thesis regarding implantology. So let's get into why I can't move it up and down. Okay. Okay, now it's, it's a little bit confusing. It is not going up and down anyway. All right, coming to the relevance of uh, the particular topic for today, um, I would like to get onto this topic with the current scenario, that is the pandemic which has affected us, which is giving a lot of financial stress to the system. So implant industry has been, traditionally been a branch of the industry which used to give, or which used to place itself at an elite practice in the industry. So the practice of implant industry in many parts of the world where the economic flexibility or financial freedom becomes a problem is going to affect the day-to-day -day practice of implants by the majority of the dentists who used to do that. So the relevance what I'm trying to stress on here is the new horizons which has come up or the challenges onto the implants practice and how we can circumvent them by incorporating or venturing into different options and different modalities which can enable us to increase our workflow of implants in a predictable manner. So as you all know that implants have become or the success of implants have become a foregone conclusion. There is nothing much about it because we know that titanium or any titanium alloy with the basic designs of any implant system placed properly with the basic protocols will work without trouble. To the extent that the recent 
publications are indicating towards almost 97 percentage of success rates. So the, the, the new horizon what we should look into is that how we can improve the situation and increase the number of cases what we can do in implant industry every day by increasing the predictability and also increasing the viability of it and bringing the implants into the mainstream by simplifying the process. So what do you mean by mainstream? Yeah, mainstream is that the implants used to be done by specialists and it, I mean, uh, majority being done by specialists and it needed a lot of armamentarium, it needed a lot of uh, surgical skills, a lot of surgical procedures and all these has kept implant industry a little bit on an elite platform and practice whom they couldn't adapt to it without proper training. Of course, training is required, but to adapt it into a simplified process into the mainstream is one of the uh, aims of today's talk. So let's, let me ask by uh, asking you one question. How many percentage of your dental practice patients are coming to replace teeth with implants? That means, my question is specific, that if you see 100 patients as an OP, how many of them are coming and telling you that I lost my teeth and I want to replace them with implants? That's a very catchy question. Unless and until you have a referral practice, if you are having a normal GP practice, I don't think it is more than five to eight patients out of the hundred. Most of the chief complaints of the patients are regarding the pain or any kind of other things. They hardly come to say that, that I have a lost teeth, unless and until it's in an aesthetic zone, maybe they will come and tell you other than that, the number of patients are not very great. So what do you think of that situation is? And why is it that your OPs don't have patients walking in to have implants place? There are three, four reasons. One of the reasons are implants have been expensive procedure, one thing. Second thing is that losing one tooth never affected them uh, in a significant way, like losing an organ. Like it's always been uh, uh, something that they could live with. So all these factors have made uh, your OP practice pertaining to implants as a chief complaint into a very minimal or minuscule level. Well, let's see whether how and why this has happened over a period of time. One of the reasons it has happened over a period of time is due to the deep penetration of preventive dentistry, dental awareness in public sector, and also availability of the qualified dental personnel to do most of the GP practices. And also the advancement in dental technology has somehow lifted away the phobia or kind of a tolerance level of the patients to dentistry. And they are more coming to the dentistry to do the basic stuff so that they retain their teeth and the preventive dentistry and the dental awareness make them uh, come to the clinic and the advancement in technology and the availability of the qualified dental personnel solve their problems and maintain their dental health so that they don't have a situation of lost teeth. Also, advertisements of oral care products from the toothpaste to the latest bleaching systems and also the new world order of aesthetic sense or we call as the beauty drives the economy. Those kind of uh, importance that is given to the a good smile has always made people flock to a dental clinic to do Hollywood smile and all those things. The success of all those things have been a result of this new world order. So all these factors have somehow given importance to dentistry and loss of teeth was something that comes at last end of it. Or is it not? So let's see that the, so the key to the future of implant practice is conversion of the cases from your GP platform to implant solutions without large scale morbidity to the patient and also giving that and helping the patients in making that decision to opt for implant solutions. What I meant by this is the implant practice shouldn't be an, a referral ex, extra uh, um, practice or elite practice, rather it should be an extension of your GP practice. So how can we do that? And what is the problems that we have and what is the opportunity? As you all know, root canal was, or root canal therapy or RCT was one of the most successful uh, dental treatment options in the last two decades. 
and it has been done left and right and center all over the world and the people were so happy to save their teeth but do you think all those dentistry were done properly we don't i don't think anyone will agree with that many of the root canal treatment that we see today are either botched up treatments with the apical infections or the treatments which never been done a crown to protect the tooth resulted in fracture of the teeth so this makes the people ex come to a situation where they may be or they may have to extract the teeth so all those teeth have to be removed and implant practice is about replacing them as early as possible and the answer is either immediate implants or even better immediate loading now let's look at it as a scenario a patient as i said doesn't come to you just because he lost the teeth for some time but on the chair if they have a broken teeth they have an infection the tooth was root canal done the tooth cannot be removed or the tooth cannot be saved so the only option would be to remove the tooth and when you give that information to the patient on the chair you will notice the patient is a little taken aback now because they are going to lose one tooth and if it is in the aesthetic zone it is disaster the first question they will ask is uh, is there any way i can avoid it and the second question they ask you is is there any way i can replace them immediately because they cannot think about a fact that they have to go out of that practice without their teeth in place so we have to think about it very or look at it very hardly and in a very focused way because the traditional conventional method of implant dentistry may not be applicable anymore we have to find solutions to give to the patient then and there on the chair and that is the best place the patient will agree to your treatment option and that is the only place that you can convert that case and make your implant practice grow so here comes the emergence of subcrestal implants and its advantages in situations like this so what are subcrestal implants before we get into that let me just dental implant highly depends on the integration between the implant components and the oral tissues including hard and the soft tissues also studies have shown that dental implants lose an average of 1.2 mm of marginal bone loss from the first thread during healing and subsequently 0.1 mm thereafter each year during or after the crown is placed or during loading and function this was first reported by adel ital and subsequently albertson smith and saab has proposed that or made it as a standard that one of the criteria for measuring the success of the implant is to allow a vertical bone loss of 0.2 mm following dental implants after first year of function so that means a loss of 0.2 mm of bone loss was an acceptable situation why was it so mainly the the solution of the problems were due to the heat generated during the fast drilling process to run in a conventional way so they had to expose the periosteal flap cutting away the blood circulations excessive pressure at the crystal region due to the design of the implants used before and also in function the excessive load and the all all encompassing peril of peri implantitis which is an extension of the periodontal disease which we have so these were the problems which were attributed to so let's see how a subcrestal implant we can circumvent this so in immediate implants and in immediate loading we cannot have this phenomenon to happen it is impossible why because already we are stuck with or we are starting with a deficient bond situation and we cannot afford to lose more bone up to the first thread in an immediate implant solution or an immediate loading solution so there is no way the old way of acceptability of implant losing bone during healing is acceptable in an immediate implant solution because that is not something that we can afford to that will definitely cause failure of the implant so what is actually a subcrestal implant so let's look at the rightmost one which is the normal uh, single stage or we can we call it as the non submerged implants 
which has been a big success story, especially with Stroman's wide neck and regular neck posterior implants. Now, what is the success of that? What is the reason for its success? As you all know, the non summers implants always given the healing of the hard and the soft tissue together. The soft tissue healing is done with the first surgery itself. That gives the implant a better healing potential of the soft tissues. And the soft tissue is, the more the soft tissue is stable, the bone remains stabler. Easy uh, for a non summers implant to function well. And it is still an option for a posterior teeth, which is lost some time ago, and we have adequate bone, then we definitely can opt for this option. So I'm not going to say that one kind of implant is not practical. No, it is not practical for a particular reason I'm saying that is about immediate implants or immediate loading or in kind of situations where we are going to do uh, uh, some situations I'm going to tell you where the subcrustal implants are indicated and not a non-submerged implant. So in the middle portion is the normal bond level implant we used to do where we used to open the flap drill the bone and place the implant at the crust, exactly at the crust of the bone. And we put a cover screw on and close the flap. And that's how we used to do the bone level implants. And that gave the, us the additional option of doing any kind of grafting procedures, which was mandatory in situations where there were bone loss, especially horizontal or buccal bone loss, in which we could graft the bone, put a membrane on, and raise the flap and then you, you could close it with submerged protocol in a two-stage way. So the third one which I'm talking about is the subcrustal implant or placing the implants deeper into the bone. How deep it is, I will talk about in detail later. But any, any millimeters below the surface of the bone, subcrustally if you place the implant, it is called as a subcrustal implant. You can see in this diagram that subcrustal implants can be placed at any levels. It can be one millimeter short, it can be two millimeter short of the crest or up to three or four millimeters short, depending on the design of the implant and the connection of the abutment and how that complex is going to be maintained without trouble for a long period of time. So placing the implant deeper is not a problem provided you have proper components to control that situation so that you will not end up with deep pre-implant pockets and deep pre-implantitis peri pre problems. So here we've seen that the non-submerged implants were placed uh, and they did immediate and early loading. It was possible because as I said, it is a single stage and there is enough uh, bond support then we could do an immediate loading also. But the problem to that always was that it never gave us an emergence profile which could mimic the natural tooth emergence. So this was one of the problems we faced with the implant neck showing on underneath or on the gum level and which used to be a problem in the aesthetic zone. While the summer's implants gave us all of them, the flexibility of the two-stage procedure gave us the other option of emergence profile, sculpting the gums, also about all these options were possible in the submerged implants. So in a subcrustal implant, we are getting all these options plus and an options to put implants in a much deeper level where even in a cases where there is bone losses, there is infections, there are other issues which normally contradicts the implant placement. In those situations also, this particular unique design of the implant, as well as the placement of it subcrustally, will enable us to get a successful solution. Let's look at it, how, what we are talking about. So here in this case, you can see the implant has been placed subcrustally around two millimeters. And also, there is something called as a platform switching. This is very important as most of you will, might know about it. This is like a wider implant platform to a shorter abutment platform transition, which gives a platform switch at the implant abutment interface. So here you can see that it has a platform switch and also 
the implant doesn't have too much crustal pressure or micro threats on the implant so that the compressive forces are not directed towards the implant crust while it is more directed towards the fins of the implant on the trabecular or cancellous bone. To take it further, a more apt design, I will show you here how very clearly the implants are placed deeper, but on healing you can see the implant hasn't gone back to the first thread of the implant, rather it is growing above it. So the platform switch and this design does work. So what else work? Let's look at this design where there is something additional comes. Here there is a subcrustal placement, a natural platform switch, but something called as a sloping shoulder. So as we know, bone loves to climb. You need to give the surface in a sloping way for the bone to climb. And it does climb over the implant if you provide a sloping slo uh, shoulder. Another thing you can see is the parallel fins or the threads with a high pitch uh, rate where you will get a lot of uh, gaps in between where the, the bone which forms are more, not in a positional nature, more in a, uh, a Haversian canal kind of bone formation, which gives a compact bone at the, uh, uh, what do you call the compact bone, com uh, bone, like compact bone at the cancellous regions of the bone. So you can see one more thing here is the cold weld or a more taper connection. That is like a platform switch with a cold weld or a locking taper connection, which has a complete bacterial seal, which helps the connection to not to attract any movement or any bacteria in that region, which gives the complex more stability and which gives a hermetic seal and a biologic width to the implant. How this is in a, with a very short implant itself, we can achieve one of the most natural contours of the gums with an emergence profile, as well as the, uh, the design of the implant, helping the implant place subcrustally to grow the implant on top. Let's see what is the evidence we have regarding all this. So as you know, one of the articles which I went through is a systematic review of all the articles which uh, did about the subcrustal placement of implants. And also it is a meta-analysis. It is one of the best forms of uh, assessing uh, any kind of literature. So here we know very clearly as in the beginning what they said about the Albertson's uh, criteria of uh, bone loss. They said clearly that according to the current literature, the Preservation of the crustal bone or peri-implant bone is considered a key feature for the success of the treatment. The bone around the implant determines the stability of the soft tissue, which in turn is the crucial aspect of aesthetics and long-term survival. And again, they keep on telling the fact that they have done a huge uh, review of the literature and they found that just placing the implant subcrustally alone will not give you the solution. That means there are implant designs which were placed subcrustally, has undergone tremendous bone loss and bone has gone down to the first thread. So subcrustal placement alone will not work. It has to be a combination of subcrustal placement with the platform switch and the locking taper or a Morse taper connection, which gives a hermetic seal so that bone has an environment to climb above the implant and avoid bone loss. Here they pointing out the results of the review and they say that the vertical position of implant with respect to the bone does not seem to be the main cause of bone loss. While this conclusion is as well in line with the results obtained later on and there are no significant difference regarding the bone loss were found in implants placing different subcrustal positions. So that means that what they conclude is that the position of the implant alone will not help. But as we know, the topic today is about immediate implants and we don't have a choice other than placing the implant subcrustally. This is a basic requirement for putting an implant into an immediate socket. Because as I said, again, going back, we are looking at converting the case immediately on the chair. 
we are going to remove the tooth and the putting the implant then and there. Then when you're going to put the implant in, we cannot put the implant anywhere crustally or supracrustally. It has to be subcrustally in an extraction socket. So when you're going to place the implant subcrustally, we should know why it should side. You cannot place any design subcrustally. That is the point of this article, which clearly says it's just not the position, but the design and other features matter. Here they see the impact of the crustal and subcrustal bone. Again, this is a systematic review. They also conclude the same that, and they come to the conclusion about the connection being one of the major issues of preserving bone at the crustal level. Here they go back to that on the thread pattern of on the implant and its osseointegration, integration, effect of the thread pattern. So this is also very important because one of the reasons why the implant loses its bone is when the compressive and the shear and the tensile forces acts more on the crustal compact bone. And if that compact bone, crustal bone is having some kind of pressure, it will give away giving rise to that V-shaped bone loss we used to see in many bone level implants. So the effect of the thread pattern has very important. So these designs which gives the subcrustal placement, it is better to have no micro threads on the crustal area where the bone has to form above it and when it functions, it should function together rather than giving pressure on the crustal side. Here we see that the thread geometry affects the distribution of stress forces around the implant and a decreased thread pitch may positively influence implant stability. While here they say that the additional threads or micro threads to the crust of the bone will of an implant provide a potential positive contribution on bone to implant contact. But whether it will preserve the marginal bone remains to be determined. So form and function of implant threads in cancellous bone was a study conducted by Grant and Bullis in a research and development article in Guildwell. They, what they found is that in a cancellous bone, especially in an immediate implant cases, we are dealing mainly with the cancellous bone. So in this kind of bone, the thread pitch is important and we need to get maximum bone in between the thread pitches. So if your fins or your threads are wider, it gives you more chances for the stability as well as for the bone to grow in between the threads. Bone levels around immediately loaded or conventionally loaded locking taper implants and they again found the locking taper or what you call as the, uh, the, uh, the connection between the implant and the abutment is the main key. There are many articles into the implant abutment connection and it is beyond doubt. I'm not going into detail about it because we are short of time and very randomized prospective, uh, prospective multicenter trials, everything has already given the verdict that which as well as with a con uh, locking taper or a Morse taper connection gives a additional advantage in situations where you place the implant subcrustally. So there are many uh, articles, I'm not going into details about it. So coming back to the uh, design, as we discussed, so as you all know, as we said, it has to be the design. So always choose the implant with the right design when you are going to perform this procedure. So what are our increased treatment options with this subcrustal placement? So as we discussed, one of the major or one of the important uh, treatment option is immediate implants and immediate loading. So there are two things which to be clearly differentiated. Immediate implants are implants we place after removing the tooth at the same time. While we don't load those implants, we submerge them to integrate. Then later on, we, after two months or three months, we open and then we conventionally restore them. While immediate loading is done when at the moment of extraction of the teeth, we place the implant and we'll give you a, uh, a restoration, maybe a temporary out of bite, but still they will give you an immediate loading protocol where there definitely will be a tooth 
placed immediately after the implant is placed. The third option is something called as a sinus transportation, which I will explain to you later. And also in cases where there is a decrease in reclusal height. This also, I will show pictures and I'll explain in detail. So let's go into the cases. So let's see this tooth, which was broken down. And what we do here, this tooth is coming in the aesthetic zone. The patient would like to have placed or replaced with a tooth immediately. So here, if you see this picture, we are not disturbing the flap at all. To the extent that I don't even raise the interdental papillae. Try to preserve the gum as much as possible where it is. Try to suction the teeth, use the periotomes or very fine elevators to remove the tooth roots and then curate the entire socket out. Then we start with the first drill. We put the first drill always leaning towards the palatal bone. In the upper maxilla, if you take a corn beam CT and analyze the maxillary bone, you will know that there always you have enough bone on the palatal side and that is a very safe area to uh, anchor your immediate implant. So, drill leaning towards the palatal bone, spurring the buccal plate, because buccal plate in many cases would be very thin. And also we cannot put stress onto that because it will break or it will uh, resorb, taking away the, uh, the periosteal, um, the gum uh, tissue along with it. So once you do the drill, then we start to prepare the bed. Preparing the bed can be done in many ways. You can use a high speed drill if there is enough bone left or you can use something known as a slow speed drill, which rotates at around 50 RPM to mold the bone in a way to create the bed. So you can see here, we have created a bed there for the implant to be placed. Once the bed is created, you can choose whichever form of um, implant design that you're going to give. You want to go with an immediate loading or you want to go with an, uh, just an immediate placement is a choice you make here. When you see the bed, when you see there is enough bone support, and if you think that you can get enough primary stability from the surrounding bone, what you created out of it, then you can definitely go with an immediate loading. So here you can see that I have gone with a submerged immediate implant protocol. We place the implant in, it is subcrystal and it is deep, and we put a bone graft. Now coming to the bone graft, we don't want, or I don't personally, and in many articles, they want a graft which maintains the space. Um, any kind of cadaver bone, any kind of xenografts, any kind of allografts are bone substitutes which will remain for more period of time in the, bone, in the uh, body and which is not something that we want in this case. What we want is to have something that will preserve the space but resorbs faster too. So the best solution is either beta tricalcium phosphate or to the extent if you want to go cheaper, you can go with a surgical grade calcium sulfate, but calcium sulfate will resolve very fast. So you have to be very clear about it. But beta tricalcium phosphate will be the ideal one. You can just place the graft in the, uh, around the implant to uh, kind of isolate it from the uh, gum tissue, which can grow inside. So as you all know, when the healing of the socket happens, the first healing happens at the uh, gum tissue or the chondrocytes. The chondrocytes gums in and we don't want the chondrocytes to go inside the bone or into the interface of the bone and the implant. We want the osteocytes, but the osteocytes comes a little late. So this graft, which remains there, isolates the bone, isolates the implant from the chondrocytes. That is the only purpose of it. Otherwise, that healing socket this will resolve and your own bone. For some time, you will see the bone forming there. You don't need to place any grafts for bone regeneration in an, in an extraction socket. It will form by its own. This graft is placed only for the gum tissue not to go inside the bone, leaving, you know, the, uh, what do you call as the soft tissue integration rather than a osseointegration. 
So here it is, that was a premolar teeth. Most of the people will ask me that, how do you do that in a molar teeth? So let's see a case where there is the molar. In this molar teeth, if you see that after the extraction by sectioning the tooth, we don't disturb the gum at all, as I told you. The placement of the first drill is always at the middle of the uh, case, or about middle of the interdental bone. What I mean is middle of the two roots. So you just first make the purchase point there, then you slowly lean towards whichever area where you can get more bone support on. You can see here, I made the first purchase point on the interdental bone, but I am here leaning towards the mesial side, enlarging more towards the distal, because first we will decide what kind of emergence we are going to have for the implant in the mouth and in the occlusion, then we'll decide which side to go in. Once that is done, the implant is placed, and then we will put the graft again. As you know, one important thing is to put a horizontal matrix figure of eight suture to hold the graft there. Because sometimes if the graft is not properly having a blood clot around it, it can come off. And if that happens, we might risk the implant getting failure. So we always put a figure of eight horizontal matrix suture to put the graft in place and secure it. You can see here uh, the X-ray of these cases. These two teeth were not uh, possible to be saved. So they were removed, two implants were placed and you can see here they are placed subcrustally and also there is the graft being placed on top. And how these grafts are given away in two months time and how the bone is formed on top of it and how we are being able to restore the teeth properly around this. This is an immediate implant case. You can see in another case, which I want to show you because the orientation of the roots were in a wrong direction. So here, the purchase point is made on the mesial aspect because that is the emergence for the future crown. So we lean towards the mesial and we place the implant mesially and a little deeper here. You can see it's quite deeper. Why? Because there were bone loss here. On the so there is no way we can place the implant above. So we have to place the implant quite subcrustally and where the native bone starts, normally I keep the top end of my implant and there we give the support on either side so that it is secured well. Then we place the graft on top and then we place the crown later on. As you see that it is still remodeling and I'm quite sure in one year, two year time, the bone will reach clearly this end. Here we see the other option, which is a sinus transportation option. How we can do this design with subcrustal placement, how this is possible. So here you can see that there is hardly any bone left here, maybe around four millimeters of uh, bone till the sinus membrane or the sinus cavity. So what we do here is we do the drills up to the sinus and then we transport the sinus with the graft material and the implant together. So there will be a sinus abutment which comes on to the crust of the implant, which locks the implant or secures the implant in position from slipping into the sinus. And it all the implant is gone inside with the graft and the entire sinus floor gets transported. So this is possible only with a subcrustal implant. It is impossible to do this with any kind of implants where on healing, if there is any bone loss coming up to the first thread, then this kind of an, a situation is impossible to uh, put implants without a sinus grafting done first or a lateral sinus graft augmentation is done and then come back after six to nine months to do it. As I told you, the main mantra is to do the procedure immediately. We cannot have procedures which used to create morbidity, which used to give more time for the grafts to cons consolidate. All these kinds of treatments are going to be difficult in practice and it is not going to improve your day-to-day -day extension of implant practice from a GP practice. Let's see an uh, Im immediate case. Again, same here, the upper tooth was not savable. We removed the tooth, 
And in an immediate socket, we could lift the sinus and transport the implant and place it with a sinus abutment. So this, as you said, it is possible even in an immediate case. Next option is about immediate loading. This is applicable for cases which is in the aesthetic zone mainly, which we have to give into the patient's requirement or demand actually that they need a tooth there. So what we can do? So you can see here, the patient came here with a broken tooth and this is has to come off. So we remove the tooth and put the implant at the same time. Here we use a, an implant system which has an active thread which will engage the bone quite tightly so that primary stability is a requirement for immediate loading. So that can be achieved quite well. In the previous cases, if you are not doing an immediate loading, the primary stability is a misnomer. We don't need too much primary stability for any subcrustally placed submerged implants. That is the truth. We just need engagements. We don't need large primary stability values. What we need is only engagement. While we are going to do a immediate loading, then we need to have proper uh, primary stability values, which you can ascertain using, um, there are many uh, machines nowadays from uh, OSTEL and ISQ level value calculation. You can do it, or you can do it by knowing how you are going to torque the implant into the bone, then you will know the torque values itself. You will come to know with the experience that there is enough primary stability to do a immediate loading. See here, you can see here, the tooth is given immediately and also the suture, you can see it's been placed to approximate the gums so that uh, the gums are going to grow well into the papillae. So this is an immediate crown, which we will change later after one month, once the primary healing is done to sculpt the tissues properly. Then later on, the patient is going in, this patient is going for all the anterior crowns. So it will be according to the proper papilla sculpting. Later on, we will finish this case. Another question being asked is if there is a periapical infection present or there is any cyst, I mean, not a big cyst, if there's a periapical granuloma present, we can do the immediate implants or not. We can definitely do it, provided we remove the tooth out, cure the socket properly and graft that area well, then there is no issues in a subcrustal or submerged implants to have an immediate implant done even with infections. I want to show you a case where how the bond regeneration potential is so good in this particular kind of subcrustally placed design. What happened in this case was there was a, uh, a filling here, which I don't know somehow it cracked and there was a uh, food impaction in this area and patient came to me afterwards with a huge periimplantitis peri problem also with bone loss. And what I simply did is, with, this is a tapered uh, lock implant, so I can just remove the crown easily. And I just put a cover screw or cover tap in and just place a graft in there and close the site for just three months. This is, this is normally impossible in any other implant system where the bone has gone down, growing the implant on top again is not easy at all. While in this kind of submerged subcrustal protocol, it is clearly possible to grow implants on top. The next treatment option is in cases where there is less interocclusal space. Look at this case where there is hardly any space for the crown to be done. But is it so? We are just looking at the gum above, but there is a huge potential of bond left here till your interdental inter nerve. So what we do is, we place the implant deeper here and immerse the crown from down to have enough crown material to support the compromised intraclusal distance. So in cases where there is an intraclusal distance is less, we can place the implant more deeper to get enough clearance for the crowns, which is not possible in any other traditional designs or in other traditional position of placements. You can see here in this case, it was a 
less intraclusal distance case, we remove the implant, put the implant deeper to get enough space there because it is already the uh, tooth number two. So there is hardly any space there in the bite. So I place the implant deeper so that the, I'm going to immerse the crown from down so that there is enough crown material and abutment length present to stabilize the tooth. Do you it solely for single cases? No, you can do this for full mouth cases too. So you can see here a complete periodontal disaster. So all this bone, if you see, is a full mouth case with an upper immediate. So what we do is we remove all these teeth and would put implants. You can see the implants. Sir, your audio is little breaking. Your participants, Dr. Vino Matthew, will be back in a few moments. Excuse me, sir. Sorry for the. Can internet. you hear me? There is a small technical glitch. We'll be okay. Continuing the session. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, you may proceed, sir. There was little break of voice in between. Ashwin, can you hear the voice? Hello. Can you hear Dr. Vinod's uh, voice? No, no, the voice is uh, breaking actually. Dear participants, sorry for the inconvenience. We'll uh, get back with the technical team and uh, correct the uh, issues in a moment. Meanwhile, dear participants, you can introduce yourself in the chat box section so that we can know uh, your uh, your name and your designation and the place where you are participating from. So uh, by the time we correct the issues, you can put your uh, names and your details in the chat session. We would love to know your names and the places where you are participating from. Thank you. 
हेलो डॉक्टर विनो सर हेलो सर वी आर नॉट एबल टू हियर यू प्रॉपरली सो काइंडली चेक विद योर इंटरनेट कनेक्शन वंस it is great to see that we have participants from across the globe i can see uh, messages pouring in from jordan and various parts of india as well right from mangalore manipal bangalore and uh, states like maharashtra tamil nadu punjab thank you for your enthusiastic participation Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. So please uh, share your screen, sir. We can continue. So can, shall I continue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Can you? Um, so what we were discussing is the first slide itself, where we found that the standard was the acceptance of zero point two millimeters of bone loss. No, it's again. hello can you hear me yes sir we can hear you now uh, but the screen is not visible as of now okay can you hear me now yes sir yes sir hello yeah okay yes, yes sir so the the standard was of loss of 0.2 mm of bone um after the placement up to healing and which was the standard and which was an acceptable one while the reasons we see here are heat generation during drilling which we can easily circumvent by doing slow drilling and also with excess coolants periosteal flap we don't do periosteal flap at all in this kind of cases we don't open the flap at all we do immediately without raising the flap and the gums tend to close by healing by secondary intention and we avoid excessive pressure at the crystal region as we told it is a very sloping sore shoulder in these implants without micro threads the ender compressive and tensile forces and the shear forces are managed by the ender threads of the system managing it together rather than giving pressure on to the crystal bone again the occlusal overload is a factor which we need to be sure of while putting the crowns in and also periimplantitis which is again in this case since the tapered lock gives a hermetic bacterial seal which gives you a very nice uh biological width forming epithelial junctional epithelial connection which stabilizes the gum complex which gives very less chances for any kind of periimplant problems unless and until as i said i showed you the one slide before if you have any kind of uh, contact loss and the food is going inside and food is going to get uh, deposited inside due to the bite or occlusion like a plunger cuss then we can get problems so the occlusion and the contacts are very important is a prosthetic issue if that is maintained then the gum complex with the natural traditional design of the implant will keep the gum complex healthy and years and years after we don't see this 0.2 mm of bone loss the bone remains stable and the gum remains stable so today what i wanted to discuss with you guys 
is to extend your practice into giving solutions, especially in this financial scenario where there is a huge uh, challenge that dental fraternity are facing. We need to incorporate more solutions in your practice, which will give you more treatment options, which will give you more revenue and more satisfaction in doing dentistry. And I do believe that implant dentistry shouldn't be something that should be kept away in a uh, museum with an elite tag on it, rather than it should be embraced as a treatment option by all the dentists who are having the skill to do these procedures as an extension of the GP practice. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is from Dr. Poonam. Uh, can bone grow uh, over the crystal implant? So will, do we have to remove it during the abutment placement? Maybe she's meaning about the second stage, uh, second stage surgery. Uh, I did get you. Um, um, do the implant does grow above the implant in subcrystal placement cases like which I have shown in the uh, x-rays, but I didn't get the second part of it. No, do, do we, we have, have to remove the it? bone in the second uh, while placing the abutment? Ah, okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. It's a good point. Okay, yes, that's an excellent point. In some cases, especially in immediate implants, we do get bone growing over the implant. Yes, we do have to remove the implant, but there are methods to do that by profile drills and profile reamers of every system which is placing subcrustally. All those implants which are bound to be placed subcrustally has got profile drills or profile reamers to remove the bone to give the emergence profile for the abutments. Oh, okay, sir. Thank yes, you. Yes, it does have to be. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Abhinav. Uh, how do you maintain parallelism while drilling for single implant? Okay. Uh, the, again, the, the parallelism concept is uh, a totally a myth concept and it was actually given for implants which had that kind of uh, placement protocols and orientation. Now, let me put it this way. Um, if you have micro threads or any kind of implant system which depends on the crustal bone for compressive and tensile forces to counter them, then we have to place the implant on a perpendicular or a you know parallel or a perpendicular orientation to the occlusal plane. Why? Because the tensile and shear stresses will put pressure on the crystal bone and it will resolve. As I told you, in this kind of implants, this is in a totally different philosophy. The implants are placed subcrustally and it doesn't depend on that crustal bone forces loading on the crystal bone to give it sub, uh, what you call the resisting the forces. The ender implant with its fins and the threads is going to resist it. So even if you place the implant off angulation, you know, already we already have all four implants and zygoma implants and many things are already, that concept is already out of the window because it is not applicable to, it is entirely depend on the design. If the design is favorable, you don't have to place the implant parallel or perpendicular to the bone. There is no point. The entire thing, what you need to look into is how the crown is going to emerge. You, are you being able to emerge the crown properly into the mouth in a proper aesthetic emergence profile manner? That is the most important thing. If you see in many cases, in the one of the cases I showed you, I changed the orientation to enable the profile or the emergence profile of the uh, tooth. So wherever the crown is going to be, that is the area where the, uh, the implant should be oriented as a stem. That is the area, that's all. It doesn't mean par parallel or perpendicular, as long as you choose the right design and the right placement. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you for answering that question. So, and one of our participants would like to know a little about sinus transportation. So can you please explain a little about sinus transportation? Methods? Okay, um, it, see, the, it is basically sinus grafting only. Why do we say sinus transportation is that we don't graft alone first and then we put the implant in. Everything happens together. So what we normally do is in, in, when there is a native bone of at least three to four millimeters, then we use very shorter implants. We don't use very long implants. We use maybe around five to six millimeters or up to eight millimeter maximum, those kind of implants. And once you reach the sinus floor, then what we do is 
we use either any technique using a piezo or using your uh, normal uh, Summers technique where you do the osteotome uh, elevation of the membrane or not. We do that, break the bone out. Then what we do is we put the graft in and we put the implant in and we are going to transport that together and that, that way the implant, or oh, sorry, the sinus lining is getting transported up gradually. So the entire complex will move up, giving that entire area with full bone coverage. So the implant, whichever it is around five to six millimeters, will be completely encompassed in the bone and it is placed subcrustally. And if the bone is thin there, we put a sinus abutment, which is going to block the implant from going into the sinus. So the sinus abutment in a normal conventional case will go and hit the uh, crustal bone. So the, the implant is two millimeters subcrustally placed with the graft below it, raising the sinus flow. That is the technique which we do it. Yeah, it needs a little bit of skill to learn, but what you can learn that. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, explaining the sinus transport method because that was the question from a few participants here. Uh, what are the complications case by in the which is under from the mammal, uh, and how to convince the patients? Uh, what are the complications? I didn't hear. Case by the beginners. Oh, okay. Beginners and implant. It's a general question on implant yeah. Um See, um, complications faced by beginners. There are a lot of complications you can do it in implant dentistry. But the point is to have proper knowledge and proper training, okay? Without that, don't try to do it. That is one thing. Second thing is know your system well because each system of the implant works in different ways. So you need to have the entire armamentarium of that particular system in place with enough, what do you call, um, the stock of implants because most of the time I've seen um, a doctors uh, looking for implants and they don't have the sizes with them. Then they go and do something which is not the right size for that particular case. Then they try to circumvent it. Then you invite trouble. So it is always better to keep maximum inventory of the system, whatever you use, and be quite familiar with that system, how to you know uh, um, do it properly, go get proper training for that, and follow the biology, follow the proper dentistry, I think uh, that is important, you know, and I do believe one thing that uh, any GPs who are practicing for more than five years, seeing minimum 10 patients per day can easily do all these procedures. But I will not advise a, a just passed out GP to suddenly start with implants, no, because we need to know the orientation of jaws and the teeth and things, because unless and until you remove some teeth, then only you realize how the, where the roots are going, how the bone socket is going. All these kind of experience is required to do this immediate implant procedures. So yes, that is something that uh, you need to gain by experience. So I wouldn't advise a novice beginner, but if you have done proper GP practice for five years, you can clearly do all these procedures. Yes, sir. Thank you. Definitely there's a learning curve for every procedure may it be the very basic thing that we start in our undergraduation, may it be the cavity preparation or the simplest of thing. We do several cases and then get a handy, uh, we get handy to the procedure. So similarly, implant is also a technique sensitive, but definitely a trained person, a skilled person, a knowledgeable person can definitely attempt doing it and definitely it will lead to success. Yes, correct. Yes. Everything is about training and is there's a saying that you are as good as what you do every day, okay? Yes. So if you are doing these things every day on a successive manner, you can, uh, what do you call, you get your, yes. uh, train, what do you call, your skills, skills your skill set is, is what, what you do every day. Yes. Practice is definitely the key to success. Exactly. So we have a final question from Dr. Rita. If the implant is placed up, subcrystal, when should be the crown margins placed? And she is asking about the loading. Okay, crown. so look, um, as I told you, whenever you place the implant subcrustally and once it heals, and when you are going to open the second stage, that is the time when we'll know where the gum levels are. So the implant, uh, the crown margins are definitely subgingival, definitely below the gum line, okay? So that is the aesthetic, 
what we need to give so definitely where the gum is going to be that is where your that is the mark point for your crown future crown so your abutment will the the stem of the abutment will end around 2 mm below the gum margin from there the gum uh, the implant crown will emerge everything in a uh, what do you call as a um, semi circular round shape okay our body likes egg semi circular shapes so if you give that shape to whatever emergence profile what you make out of the abutment or out of the crown whichever way the gum will follow that just like how the bone will climb up over a sloping shoulder the gum loves the some semi circular design or the will adapt better on to that rather than a flat or a curved or a concave shape it it on a convex semi circular shape it really adapts so that is the goal it should be so once that is achieved then the implant crown will be once finished will be 2 mm 1 to 2 mm below the gum line uh, thank you so much sir for Excuse answering me. all the questions uh, continuing to that question the important thing would be to choosing the abutment there rather than the crown okay that abutment height is very important that is the one point i have to tell you when you do the second stage surgery we will measure the length from the implant stop to the gum level that would be the abutment size what we choose so that it will come below the gums for the crown to come so you cannot have the implant crown going too deep and too too much shallow either so that abutment selection is crucial and that is done on the second stage surgery mm -hmm.